This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you today to the first of two Hitchcock lectures to be given by Professor John Horton Conway. Hitchcock professorship is one of the earliest endowments at the University of California, Berkeley. It was developed from a bequest of property made in 1885 by Dr. Charles M. Hitchcock, a San Francisco physician with a long interest in education. As stated in his will, the purpose of the bequest was to establish a professorship at the University of California quote, for free lectures on scientific and practical subjects, but not for the advantage of any religious sect, nor on political subjects, unquote. The university received an additional gift in 1930 from Dr. Hitchcock's daughter, Mrs. Lily Hitchcock Coit, perhaps best known as a donator of funds to build Coit Tower in San Francisco. Mrs. Coit directed that the professorship made possible by the enlarged endowment be designated the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Professorship in memory of her parents. The great extent to which this endowment has enabled the faculty, staff, and students of the university, and the general public as well, to become closely acquainted with distinguished scholars from throughout the academic world is evident by the list in your program of those who have served as Hitchcock lecturers and Hitchcock professors. We are proud to see the long tradition of Hitchcock professorship so eminently upheld by a scholar of the stature, Professor Conway. Professor Conway is a John von Neumann Professor of Mathematics at Princeton University. He came to Princeton in 1989 after having been a Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University. And he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1981. Professor Conway is without question one of the leading mathematicians of the day and is extremely well known for his originality and imaginativeness. He's done breathbreaking work in several important areas of pure mathematics, including a pivotal contribution to classification of simple finite groups, one of the most significant mathematical achievements of the past two decades. He was also one of the pioneers in the revival of the theory of knots, which has had such surprising recent connections with theoretical physics and molecular biology. He is also one of the originators of the combinatorial game theory, and is probably best known outside the mathematical community as the inventor of the game of life which has become one of the most popular computer software entertainments. So as Conway showed, it can also be thought of as a universal computing machine. Without further delay, I'm pleased to present to you Professor Conway, whose lecture topic today is Tangles, Spangles, and Knots, in which you'll explain how knots are best understood in terms of kind of broken arithmetic of fractions. by not for a very long time. And uh, in fact, I started when I was at uh, high school back in Liverpool in England. I used to go along to the local re reference library there and look at these ancient papers on knots um, and uh, try to understand them. Uh, at least uh, not try to understand the ancient papers. That was easy enough because they didn't really say anything. They just described a whole lot of knots. Um, <laughs> but to sort of understand how knots worked. And uh, I sort of found out something about how knots worked. I never understood it. <laughs> um, but I did sort of see a certain thing that happens with knots and um, that I'm going to tell you about. Um, but let me start off first by uh, asking some sort of random questions about knots. Um, the first question is, I mean, is there a knot. Um, uh, you see, that's not as obvious as it looks at first sight. If I take a piece of string, now where is where are my nearest bits of string? I lose them whenever I under the chair. Under the chair. Under the chair. Oh, but there's too much string here. 
So that's the message. Not on the money. Let's just take a bit. Um, uh, these scissors aren't so sharp. Okay. Um, so here it is. Now, let me first of all cheat by tying this knot without leaving go at the end. Suppose now that I seal that up with, um, uh, you know, I sort of put some tape on that. I haven't got any, unfortunately, so you'll just have to sort of uh, bear with me and just pretend that this is sealed. Can you undo that without? Um, you know, breaking the string at all. Uh, what's the question mean? Uh, it seems to me, is there a continuous way of um, moving this string so that no time does it ever cross itself, and such that eventually, at the end of it, the thing uh, looks like an unknotted piece of string? Well, the first thing to understand, you, uh, perhaps, is that that isn't the question. Just let me show you one. Here's a knot, and I'm wondering whether I can continuously move it until it looks like that, without at any time either breaking the string or letting it cross itself. Well, the answer, unfortunately, is yes. Just watch. Um, ever cross itself. I mean, if you think of the string as parameterized, there's here's t equals naught. I shouldn't use the parameter t. Let's call it theta. Theta equals naught. Uh, theta equals 0.1. Theta equals 0.2. And by about here will be a 0.5. And then here it's 0.9. And so theta equals more than once. It's, it's the same point. That's, uh, that's a parameterized curve. Um, then, you know, here's theta equals naught again, and then theta equals 0.1, and so on. And at no time do any two distinct values of the parameter give the same point as the knot. So that was actually the wrong question. Um, uh, there are two fairly standard ways of uh, making the question okay. One of them is to thicken up the knot until it's a solid torus, like this and then ask whether that solid torus can be continuously moved, such that at all times it remains a solid torus. And then, you see, that would make this one a little bit hard to do. The torus would have to be pinched to a point, and, uh, and you can't do it. But that's, roughly speaking, what happens with this string. The string isn't a mathematical curve. It hasn't got zero thickness. It's a solid torus. Uh, the other method I rather like, because it comes with some sort of strange mental pictures, the other method is, I was thinking of it like this, fill all the space with a kind of aspic jelly, <laughs> and have the, the knot suspended in the middle. I'd like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, distort the jelly continuously, so that this picture, this curve goes on to this one. That's, in other words, in technical terms, that's to take an auto-homeomorphism of space that carries one knot onto the other. It perhaps helps to make it clear, too, that knot theory is really as much about the containing space as it is about the knot. Uh, a knot is not just a curve, but it's a curve embedded in space in some way. Um, but then, you see, having answered the question properly, uh, you know, there's another way of thinking about this, but perhaps I won't bother. Um, but let's always think of our curve now as, uh, as really a solid torus. And let's ask this question again. Can this be unknotted? Well, maybe. I don't know. <coughs> let's try taking this loop of string here and pulling it back underneath this one. Good. And then let's take uh, this loop of string here and pull it out over this one. Fine. 
And then let's pull this piece of string back across here. Yeah. And then let's do more and more and more and more and more. <laughs> Until perhaps what started off as a knot with just three crossings, a picture with just three crossings, ends up having about a million crossings. Okay? And then let's arrange that we've done this in such a very, very clever way that we can sort of undo it in a way that we didn't do it, if you understand me. We can uh, start simplifying the picture and so on. And maybe you can, just possibly. I mean, I just want to make it clear that the, not, none of the intuition that you've had is reliable. Maybe the only reason why nobody's ever succeeded in undoing a knot like that, that trap worm knot there, is because you have to go up to a million crossings to do it. Now, if that were so, that would be entirely consistent with all the things we've observed so far, because we've never ever taken it that far. Um, and things like that can happen. There are very mysterious things that do go on in this world. Um, and maybe there are ways of undoing all knots, but uh, they're rather complicated. And maybe, in fact, I don't cheat when I do this thing. Okay? Many of you see me cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll do it very slowly if you like. <laughs> Watch. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> you tell me if you ever see me leaving there. Sorry, that's probably a bit too far. <laughs> okay, you're watching. My left go in. My left go in. So, let me, let me tell you first how the easiest proof I know of the fact that knots do exist and that you can't, um, you can't tie knots without leaving. Of course, when I handed you that knot, you noticed on that up here? <laughs> when I handed you the knot. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so where are we? Uh, well, it's fairly easy to see that all the little manipulations you do to the diagram can be got in terms of these three moves. Uh, you, you're supposed to pretend that elsewhere the diagram looks the same on the left and right. Um, here, if I pull that string up there and pull these two down a bit, it will convert to this diagram. And these are called the randomized moves. Number one, because it involves one crossing, number two, and number three. Um, and now, uh, the clever trick here is to discuss what I call numberings of a knot. Now, let me tell you what the numbering of a knot is. I assign a little number to each bit of string. I might say put three on here. It's not 3,333. It's just that I sort of don't want to lose track of the fact that it's three. So I label it in three all the way along. And then perhaps the number that I've stuck here is seven. And the rule is to be that whenever A, B, and C are the numbers attached to three bits of string like that, then A, B, and C are in arithmetic progression. Uh, that's to say that uh, the amount that you have to increase A by to get to B is the same as the amount you have to increase B by to get to C. So what do I put here? Three goes up by four to seven. Come on, what's the next one? It goes up by four to 11. Uh, and now to indicate the fact that we did that, I put a little splodge there. Uh, let me uh, find an arithmetic progression labeling of our big knot here. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I think I'll call this bit of string zero. And this one, well, it doesn't very much matter, I'll call it one. Zero, one, two. Good. I was 
intriguing recently, and whenever I ask them for anything, they're all sucked at me. But you can tell when you're in California. Um, one, two, three. Yeah, that's a good one, wasn't it? Two, three. Ah, well, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, uh, we solved that by declaring that 1 equals 4. <laughs> uh, and the way to manage to make that is to remark that it's actually true modulo 3. So uh, if we call two things the same, if they differ by a multiple of 3, then this is still working. Oh, and look, when I continue these screens around to here, uh, yeah, that still works. So this is a proper numbering, not fit. <laughs> um, well, what else the point of these proper numberings? Well, let me tell you. You can easily prove a nice little theorem. The number of numberings doesn't change. Let's say never changes. It's a fantastic theorem. Uh, when I say never changes, I mean when you make these moves. So, if I have something with a given number of numberings in some given domain of numbers, it doesn't matter very much, it will stay the same. Let me just show you why. You say, suppose I have a numbering of the, of the diagram on the left here. So this is number from number A. 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 All the way around, it's A. Now, A. A. What's the next thing? A. <laughs> OK, well, now that's very interesting, because this n tends out to be necessarily labeled with the same number as the beginning. And therefore, um, I can derive a numbering for this diagram. Now, I hope you understand what happens here. Uh, this is really just a portion of the diagram. It really looks like this. There's all sorts of interesting junk going on here. And then on the right-hand side, it's the same interesting junk. <laughs> On here. But you see, whatever this interesting junk was, if this was a proper numbering, these two bits were both labeled A. And so I can get a proper numbering with this one. So from any proper numbering of the left hand side, I can get one of the right. And from any one of the right, it comes from one on the left by this method. And so the number of numberings hasn't changed. And now let's look at this, you see. Let's call this string A and this one B. And here's a really hard bit written. A, B, well, C is really good. <laughs> uh, so let's call it C, but there is actually a formula for C. C is twice B minus A. But it doesn't terribly much matter, because if A, B, C is an arithmetic progression, so is C, B, A. Okay? And so C, B, A. Automatically, Whenever you have a numbering of this diagram, the number here is the number here. That's obvious, because they were on the same different string. But the number here is also equal to the number here, despite the fact it went underneath for a time. And so, OK. So you can derive a, a, a numbering of that one. And so the number of numberings doesn't change. Um, if we did it for this one, well, I'll just have to do it very quickly. A, B, those are without the student after. Here's C. This number had better be 2c minus a for that crossing to work. And this number had better be 2c minus b for this crossing to work. And now, this number had better be twice 2c minus a minus 2c minus b for this one to work. And now let's start off here. Put b is here, and a is here, and c is here, just the way we did then this one had better be twice a minus b for that crossing to work. This had better be twice c minus a for that crossing to work. And this one had better be twice c minus 2a minus b for this crossing to work. And when you actually look at it, you see that this is labeled with the same number as that. Here's an a, and here's an a, and here's a b, and here's a b, and here's a c, and here's a c. And here's a 2c minus a, and here's a 2c minus a. 
And then if you're any good as algebra, you'll find that that expression is actually the same as that one. <laughs> That's a wonderful miracle. And, and therefore, we have the same principle there. And therefore, the number of numberings doesn't change. I've proved it. <laughs> um, and that's really wonderful. Now, let's look at the number of numberings of this one, mod 3. Every number is either 0 or 1 or 2 mod 3. Sorry, that was supposed to be 2. And those are the only numberings it has. It's got three numberings, mod three. Now let's look at this one. Well, it's got all north, all one, all two, and that one two. Okay. Uh, so it's got at least four numberings, not three. In fact, if you think about it, it has nine, because uh, these are really just not one and two in any old order you like, and the six orders and so on. So this actually has nine numberings, not three. And this only has three numberings, not three, and therefore they can't be the same. Uh, if we did this uh, little fantasy that I was describing over here somewhere, um, no matter how complicated that diagram got, even when it got up to a million crossings, it would have nine labels, not three. <laughs> and then you can't possibly bring it down to something that only has three labels, not three. So there's a proof, which uh, I hope is the first proof that most of you have met, that not actually exist. It's quite a simple little proof. Okay. Um, having got that, though, it's it, it interesting to prove more interesting things. Let me just show you uh, the theorems I proved when I was a kid, but then I found it had been proved before, unfortunately. Um, that's a very nice theorem. Uh, it concerns the problem of cancelling two knots. Can you tie two different knots in the same bit of string? Here I'm tying a left-handed knot, and over here a right-handed knot in the same piece of string. Can we now sort of fasten these together and jumble these up somehow and gradually undo them? Can they be made to cancel? Can two knots cancel? Well, uh, let me just rather hastily give you my proof that no two knots cancel. It's a proof I'm very, very fond of. Um, suppose we have two knots that cancel. I'm going to suppose they're not A and B. And that there's some long-haired guy who, uh, with a great deal of hocus-pocus, pretends he can undo these. Okay? Uh, so what we do is that we actually attach the end of this piece of string rather firmly to a wall, the wall there, and attach this end to a wall here in a room. And then we ask him to do the magic that takes this picture to this picture. So, in other words, our room now. Oops. This man pretends that he can actually undo this piece of string, which means he can continuously deform the contents of this room until it looks like the contents of that room. And then we say, OK, if you're so clever, and I obviously must be clever if you're doing an impossible thing here, um, you ought to be able to do it with some extra stuff thrown in. So what we do is we go and get some very flexible inner tubing and do this. We follow the first knot. OK? And then we swallow the second one. This is called the swallow follow proof. Um, now, if you look at that tube, anybody would say, if asked what way that was knotted, they say it's knotted in type A. <laughs> More than that. Now, what's that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means, really. I say a, a tube is knotted in a given type if when I draw a chalk line along the surface of that tube, from one end to the other, it's not within that type. 
No matter, if you draw a chalk line along him, the chalk line is entirely on the surface and it doesn't cross itself. It might sort of wander around back and forth like this. But no matter what it is, it's easy to see, so to speak, you can pull it taut on the surface and then it would be a copy of A. And I'm not fooling you, that's also fairly easy to prove. Um, but now, let's ask our magician, please. This is best using the aspect jelly model. Fill the whole, that whole room with aspect jelly, please. And now, distort the aspect jelly until that central curve looks like that. You can do that if it's not knotted. <laughs> and then, what on earth's happened to the other tubing? <laughs> Well, it's been carried somewhere, and I can't easily draw it for you. It's probably terribly messed up. Um, you know, this little circle here, and all I'm drawing here is where it intersects the vertical plane, because it's got into some horrible shape, and I'm not a good enough artist to show you. So, for instance, here, you know, this sort of punch through the plane, it was a sort of tube of it, and you're just seeing a little circle where it went through. But now, you say, OK, we say, clever guy. If you did this, you can undo it. But just before you undo it, what I want to do is put a chalk mark along this curve. Now, this chalk mark is and it, it, it's the curve, it's part of the curve of intersection of the tube with the vertical plane. And it goes from this point P to this point Q, and it lies entirely in the surface. So when he undoes it, it will be one of these curves here <laughs> that lies entirely in the surface and starts from P and goes to Q. And what did we say about such curves? They're knotted in type A. But you can see in this picture that it's not knotted at all. <laughs> and therefore, if ever you have A and B that collectively can be undone, then A and B can individually be undone too. I just proved that A can be undone and B can be undone. And so it's never possible. No two knots can stop. Well, you know, I think my task is nearly over now. Your task is about to begin. But the trouble is, I've lost the string. Um, I have some bits of string already cut. Sorry? Now, they're hanging out of the bag, that's for the later bit. <laughs> Maybe they're in the right hand pocket of the jacket. Who knows? Yes, they are. Good. But what I haven't got is the volunteers, <laughs> otherwise known as the conscripts. Um, so, can I please have them, please? Four of them, I want. Tom. <laughs> Uh, okay. Two. Come on, we want a, another person of another sex. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> there are enough people in the sexes around. Okay, great. So, who are these? Okay, so you're all the hell woman. Now, um, uh, this is this, the sort of topic I'm going to call tangles. And I'm going to tell you another thing that I found when I was a school child which is a wonderful correspondence. Uh, well, a tangle is a bit of knottedness with four ends coming out like that. <laughs> OK? Um, so here's a particular tangle, T. And this is the tangle T plus 1. Um, and, and we've got to train these volunteers to be able to do this. Uh, here is how they get the tangle minus 1 over t. OK. Now we've got to start training them. OK, so uh, fine, that's great. Now, incidentally, they're part learned. Now, you two people at the, uh, near the board should stand up. And there won't always be you. And this is called the display mode. When the two people at the front kneel down, and the two people at the back stand up. And as part of your training, you have to applaud in these circumstances. Don't take is because they don't deserve all that much. Um, now, this object here, is the, which they would just display when you applauded, was the tangle for zero. So this is zero. Okay. Now we've got to teach them to add one. Okay. 
Uh, so to, the person who's in that corner should pass behind and over the person in front. And they won't always be these two people. So display, please. Good. Great. Okay. 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 What, what's the name of this tangle? One. One. Good. OK. That's called twisting them up. Twist them up. <laughs> twist them up. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> the person in that corner goes over. What's this? Two. Two. Don't applaud because they didn't display. Ha, ha, ha. Twist them up. Oh, they did, actually. <laughs> twist them up. Where are we now? Oh, yeah. Where are we? Quick. Now, turn them around. Now, you all move one place clockwise. <laughs> Stop. OK. Now, where are we? Good. Where are we then? Minus a third. OK. Turn them around again. Where are we now? Three. And it looks exactly the same as if we haven't turned around at all. OK, turn them around. Don't keep displaying all the time, because I'm going to afford. OK, now we're at minus a third again, OK? Twist them up. Where are we? Two thirds. Twist them up. Where are we? Five thirds. OK. Twist them up. Where are we? Eight thirds. Turn them around. Where are we? Minus six. OK, twist them up. Oh. OK. Now, I want you to direct them back to zero. <laughs> We're at five eighths. Shake all around. <laughs> what do you think we should do? Should we twist them up? What would happen if we twist them up, folks? We've got to 13 eighths, which seems quite complicated, doesn't it? We won't go so far. So what should we do instead? Tell them. Where are we? OK. Twist them up, somebody said. Where are we? Minus three fifths. What should we do now? <laughs> you choose. Where are we? We're at minus three fifths. Twist them up seems to be what they're saying. Where are we now? Where are we? to select a fraction for me. If I did it right, this is 17 thirteenths. Okay. Keep tight hold, by the way, because it's an absolute disaster if it goes wrong. Okay. Come on. Get get to infinity. <laughs> Where are we? 
Hey, wait a minute, no, stop. We're at minus 17 thirteens. Oh, we're at 4 17 you said. I hope somebody, you, yeah, you, you're, you're appointed the initial number. Okay. 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 Where are we? And then it could go to minus 1 over that, which would be minus t over uh, 2t minus 1. And then we could add p to that, which would add 6t minus 3. So we get 5t minus 3 over 2t minus 1, and so on. And in general, what you get is an at plus b over ct plus d, where in fact ad minus bc equals 1 if you like. So what's actually happening here is that the effects of twisting them up and turning them around are gradually building up a general transformation like that. Now, um, uh, it would have been rather nicer if we had a large hole in this stage and one of those big bandy balls. <laughs> um, uh, because then I could uh, show you the effect. So imagine this is a very big ball and this is got four bits of string coming out of it. And then we have four volunteers who are set to be square dancing here. So here they are. Um, and they're all holding their, their bits of string here. So of course the other person. Um, but you see, these bits of string go down here through the hole in the wall and they eventually get to this ball. Um, now, if you have that situation, then as these people are square dancing, let the ball descend, and you'll see they're building up a braid, which records their actions, or at least uh, some of their actions in sufficient detail uh, for all effects on the nose. And so what we're proving there is, roughly speaking, that this braid group is the same as this group. Well, that's not actually literally true. There's a factor of four dependent on things. You see, suppose I had, had those people um, 
uh, do the following thing. Come and volunteer, just for a very quick moment. You have to be two people. Okay. So put the, let's go into this mode. Okay. Okay. But now let both of us interchange our hands like that, so to speak, and it looks exactly the same. Okay. But it's not the same because this person is a distinct person to this person. And similarly, if we both, come on, did this, it would look the same. Um, okay, well that's enough. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, it turns out there's a factor of four between uh, the brave group and this group. Uh, in order to know precisely what a brain is in the degree of, of uh, detail that's necessary for this kind of theory anyway, we need to know not only what this matrix is, but where one particular person is. Okay? Um, if we know where one particular person got to, we know where all the four people got to, and we also know what the brain is. Okay. Um, but let me now start moving on from tangles, which are these things, to bangles. Um, you see, what I'm interested in is classifying knots as far as possible. Um, and it turns out that there are quite a few knots that you can get like this. Um, but we can go on putting obviously many of these things here. And then we go right round the back. Um, the way to think of this is that I tie a tangle. Now you know tangles, have, I mean many tangles anyway, have these nice little names. Uh, so you, you won't be at all surprised anymore, I hope, when I tell you that's two thirds. Okay? And now I've got two thirds here. Here is a fifth. <laughs> and, and then there's two thirds and so on. So let me just uh, do what I've done in the string. That's one fifth. And here's two thirds. And here's, uh, I don't know, what will happen to minus a half? And then it will go all the way around the world, which I can do like that. And this is the tangle I call a fifth plus two thirds minus a half in some kind of parentheses. Um, now, officially, I should use some sort of fancy plus sign here and a fancy minus sign here for that matter. Um, but I should just sort of suppose that that's done. And you'll know what I mean when I talk about A plus B plus C plus D plus dot, 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 in parentheses. Now, um, what would happen if I took this number, which is minus a half, and I added a crossing there. What's this tangle? It's plus a half. You see, we just twisted them up. Okay? Um, uh, well, it's a rather interesting thing. If I, uh, I, I never allowed our uh, volunteers to twist them down, but let me allow myself to twist them down. What I've done here is I've introduced two more crossings in between these two by just pulling up this bottom loop over the top loop. And then, oh, perhaps I should redraw it, make it a bit neater, until it looks like that. Okay. And then this is two thirds twisted down. What's that? Minus a third. Okay. Um, and this would be minus a half twisted up. What is it? Plus a half. And this is the same knot. And I could redraw it like this. And 
this actually looks totally different from the knot I have up there, but it is the same knot. Uh, because this is minus a third, and this a half. What I've just shown you is that a plus b plus 1 plus c minus 1 plus d. Really, I should write that. Let, let's have a different one. Let's make this b minus 1. And let's call this 1 plus c. <laughs> to make it yourself really rather easy. That is this thing. L, b, and then here's a minus 1 and a plus one, and C, and D, and so on. And you see, this doesn't make any difference. This is the same thing as A plus B plus C plus D. Um, or another way of thinking of this is that integers can be passed freely around the circle. Whole numbers can be passed freely around the circle. Um, so for instance, if I had A plus 5, and then B, C, D, that would be the same as A, and then B plus 5, C, D. Or if you like, it would be the same as A, B plus 3, C plus 2, D, D. <laughs> as long as you can put the integers anywhere, provided they just add up to the right amount. And it turns out, surprisingly enough, that that's all the equivalences there are between bangles. That if you just specify a list of rational numbers, except that you're allowed to add integers to them, but only provided that the total amount remains unchanged. Um, then you specify the knot. And there's one one correspondence between the knots you can get in that way and their names, <laughs> um, taking that uh, integer thing into account. Uh, well, that's not quite true. I mean, A plus B plus C, you know, if I had this, it would be like a strap around my wrist that had three wristwatches on it. <laughs> one called A, one called B, one called C. Well, obviously, I could go take them. <laughs> a plus B plus C is the same thing as B plus C plus A, but I was thinking of that was trivial. And the other thing I could do is I could take the watch off and put the other one down, and then it would be the same as C plus B plus A. <laughs> um, but those, those are sort of obvious. Those bangles related like that look geometrically the same right from the start. What wasn't obvious are these changes, that you can add integers to them all, provided the total integers are either zero. So those are bangles. That's the theory of rational bangles. Uh, I should mention that I conjectured, although not out loud, unfortunately, uh, that that was the complete theory of bangles, um, of rational bangles. Uh, the way I conjectured it, you can see the evidence for that statement. I wrote a paper on knots once, which included a great enumeration of them at the end. And many of them were bangles, and they were just obviously just enumerated every possible one in order. And that was because I had discovered empirically that there weren't any uh, non obvious relations that speak. Um, now I'm going to tell you a sort of thing that I discovered just a few years ago um, when trying to explain something uh, about, about the next class of months. Let me just sort of tell you. Here, I can take a rational tangle, and we've just been discussing adding two of them like that. Um, but this is no longer a rational tangle, it's a, it's a sort of complicated one. You see, a half plus a half, let me show you what a half plus a half looks like. Well, a half plus a half isn't equal to one. Here's one. Uh, they just look totally different. So, if you want this to think of this as a plus sign, you must see that the kind of arithmetic we're discussing has been broken. It's still true that the half plus one equals three halves. Um, as long as one of the two things you're adding is an integer, then they add up well. And also, it's still true that if you apply any one of these transformations to a rational number, you get the right answer. So the arithmetic of Mobius transformation still works for these things, and the arithmetic of adding integers still works. But adding two tangles, both of which are non-integers, well, it's just broken. I mean, you know, machines nowadays have this irritating habit. You ask them to do algebra, and they're all so clever. And you get a lot of some algebra system, and you ask it to uh, work out what 3 plus 2 is. You say 3 plus 2 equals something. 
and it says something other than that. It says 3 plus 2 equals 3 plus 2. <laughs> and, you know, you can't fault it, because it actually does. <laughs> but it's not quite what you intended. Uh, well, another similar thing happens when we try and add a half to a half in the system. A half plus a half is just a half plus a half. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but now we can do what I call harmonically add, which is to add in the vertical direction. So here is A and B and C. This is A plus B, harmonically added, whatever that is. Let's call it plus bar C. Let me. You add vertically instead of horizontal. Um, but now that I've got that, I can add a D and an E to it on the left, and then I might add an F to it at the top. I'm sorry. And the, the kind of tangles that I get that way, I now call arithmetical tangles. I used to call them algebraic, but then that word algebraic was used in another context. And I think arithmetical is rather nicer because they have some arithmetical names, like a half plus a half. One over a half plus a half. Well, let's say minus one over a half plus a half is something you don't have to do. If you take a half plus a half and rotate it all. So there is minus one over a half plus a half. <laughs> if you're interested, or even if you're not. Um, okay, so now let me tell you the. Um, <clears throat> the answer to the theory of uh, arithmetical knots. An arithmetical knot is what you can get from an arithmetical tangle by doing that. And uh, my sort of recent discovery, really, is that the theory of bangles completely explains those. And it's very, very beautiful. The technique is this. I take some bangle here, except that in one place, in one place, I have a rather suspicious looking thing. Um, these four strings come out, and then they get braided together somehow, and then they break open again and go to another bangle. And uh, that's called a pair of handcuffs, okay? <laughs> With uh, a braid. But you know, I could be a little bit more adventurous. I could take this thing here and replace it by yet another way to yet another bangle and so on. And I can build the whole tree of bangles connected by these braids. Well, the really wonderful thing is that a braid, after all, is just a sequence of square dancing instructions to twist them up, turn them around, and so on. And it turns out that uh, you can completely specify it by giving the image and the inverse image of infinity. So let me just show you what I mean by that. You see, if I tell you what A over C is, that's totally two of the parameters here. And I forget what the inverse image of that is. I think it's minus D over C is the number, yes, that would go to infinity. This Infinity goes to A over C, and minus D over C goes to infinity. And if I tell you these numbers, A, C, and D, I tell you these fractions, and I've really told you A, C, and D, and then I've told you B because it's the number one. <laughs> and so it turns out that, look, if I have a braid like this, um, oh, well, let me just show you. To get the image of infinity, I just rub out what was there and put an infinity on. Now, remember, an infinity is that. So I just change this by joining these two ends together, and then pull it back. And then this will be the tangle A over C. Um, but if instead I took this braid and cut it down here and did the same thing, pull this back, this will be the tangle minus the over C. And it turns out that these two, two things completely specify the braid. So my clever idea is to have what I call a schizoid notation, in which whenever you have a braid like this, you pretend that it's two rational tangles instead. 
Um, and then you also have to tell me, this is, this is uh, where these little ends went through. You have to say, for instance, that this piece of string here really is the same as this piece, or something like that. But let's ignore that for the moment. Um, then, whenever you have a whole lot of bangles connected by these braids, you can sort of snip the braids and produce a whole lot of bangles not connected by these braids. Uh, but wherever there was an end of braid, it becomes a rather suspicious rational number with an instruction saying, hey, you thought this was a rational number, but it's really uh, one end of a braid, and the other end is down there <laughs> somewhere. And then that collection of bangles completely specifies the number of the game plan. Uh, all the equivalences are just geometrically off. It's a very, very beautiful, simple thing. Well, you know, I'm, I'm disguising things a little bit because I wanted to trivial little complications, but they're not significant. Um, and, uh, and this theory completely classifies the arithmetical knots. Uh, perhaps I should say this is another sort of conjecture I made many, many years ago. A conjecture I made, but once again, not allowed. This conjecture was actually proved um, by uh, Siebenman and Codron and somebody else. Um, so we know that this theorem is true. <laughs> um, I've been very, very interested ever since in trying to enlarge this domain of knots. I believe that knot theory, first of all, I believe that knot theory is fundamentally geometric. I think that's uh, Bill Thurston's great insight into knot theory. Um, we now do have an algorithm that tells you whether two knots are equivalent. Um, but I think the proper way to do it is in Thurston's geometrical way. And this is really the first piece of Thurston's theory. I think there are successive um, enlargements of the class of knots that you can understand um, by sort of simple formula. You know, so initially, there's a class of rational knots, um, which are just when you take a rational angle and do that to it. Uh, you get rational knots. They're more or less the same as the rational numbers, not far. Um, then there's a class of rational bangles. Then there's this class of arithmetical knots, which are really dangled bangles. <laughs> uh, I ran out of bangle words after a time. Um, I have bangle, bangle, tangle, new bangle, bangles. <laughs> and I then turn to apples. Um, the next class of knots, which I believe I have a sort of complete understanding of, are the mandibles. Um, <laughs> which you get like that. Um, uh, I mean, manacle is the nth word, or the nth word, in the sequence that has the word pentacle in it. Pentacle is a name for a five-pointed star. I have it as a name for a notch in which there are five particular rational tangles embedded in the structure. So tell you what you do, you take the edges of a four-dimensional simplex, and then at each vertex, you put a rational knot. That's a pentacle knot. Uh, well, that generalizes when you replace five here by many. <laughs> um, and I believe that I have a complete theory of manacles, too. <laughs> uh, but it's perhaps a little bit complicated to explain. Anyway, I, I'm very, very interested in what knots are. I mean, let me tell you how I sort of first came up with a problem here. How do you describe a knot over the telephone? to your friend. Um, uh, well, you know, it's really rather hard. Um, you tired the wretched thing. Well, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, there's the figure eight knot, uh, which is different to the knot we normally do. How do you describe that? Well, you know, uh, the ordinary knot, the trefoil knot, you now ought to be able to understand. Let me just show you the trefoil knot again. Um, now, the trefoil knot is the knot one third. <laughs> OK, very good one. It's equally, of course, the knot minus two thirds. I just subtracted one point. <laughs> and it's the knot minus five thirds. It, they're rational numbers, not integers, essentially. Um, the figure eight knot, which I'm about to tie now, um, is the knot two bits. Um, well, I'm sure you can see it, so I'll just sort of bring it out. 
Um, so one partial answer to my question of how do you describe a knot over the telephone is to set up this system, <laughs> and then off you go. But it doesn't describe every knot, unfortunately. Um, I think most of the ways that people have, uh, have had of describing knots have been wrong-headed in that they really describe a picture of the knot on the plane. And I've been deliberately trying not to do that, but to describe the thing three-dimensionally right from the start. Because after all, knots are three-dimensional things. But because they're, they're, they're really fantastically amazing. Oh, my God, I, I will show you the last thing. Uh, it's years since I've been able to do this. So Mark uh, is just uh, giving me some string of this rather special kind. Um, this is this is well worth uh, watching. This oh yes, can I have some of that out here? No, it's just trapping. What I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a knot. You know, keep them separate if you can. I'm going to braid one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, now, uh, 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 now. Okay. This is this is a very very beautiful knot. Oops. I need to come this way. So. Um, thank you. Oops. Now I'm going to try to get it so that as many of you can actually see it as possible. Put it on the overhead projector. Uh, you know, I don't think I can, I'm afraid, um, because it will all sort of fall apart. I could put it on a flat thing and tip it up for you, but I can draw it instead. Um, whoops. I think I can draw it. No, you may as well. <laughs> okay, I hope you can see how it was got. It was got by braiding. Uh, these three strings and then turning the braid around and then joining it up. That's called the three strand in five by the third second. Um, there's a beautiful thing that happens, which is that there's a not a two dimensional sphere in four space whose central cross section is that. Let me just um, say something. Uh, I'm going to do a little action which is going to start with this object here. Let me perhaps just sketch it a bit better here. We can start with that object at the time uh, t equals zero, let's say at 12 noon. And then I'm going to bring two portions of this string together. So that at time t equals one, one a.m., uh, well, I don't know. Two, two portions of this are actually meeting. And then they came like that. But then I'm going to break them apart like that. So the time key equals two. Well, OK, let me, let me just show you something. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is prove that this thing is what we call a slice knot. That there is a knotted sphere here, like this. Well, okay, so let me just show you what I'm going to do. At the moment, that curve is a single curve. Now, if we forget the way it's embedded in space, it's time zero now. If we forget the way it's embedded in space, it's a curve. It's a circle. But now I'm going to pick up two portions of it, okay? and bring them together. It's now time one. OK. And now I'm going to rejoin like that. OK. This is OK, good. So there we are. 
Um, the sale, let me just. Uh, so now uh, it then passed to this. Okay? Um, and now I'm going to show you that these two loops are in fact separable, that I can shrink them to points and move them away from each other without the interfering. Okay? So let me just do that. I, mean, I don't think it will make much difference if I make these a little bit shorter. It will make a difference in that I'll be able to do it without making too much of a mess. Okay. So here we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh! <laughs> I wondered whether it would happen, actually, Mark, because they're all there. Well, I'm sorry, let me just tell you what should have happened. We'll try and do it right at the time, anyway. Let me just tell you what happens. You can really separate them. By the time I got to about 15, they come apart as two separate groups. Um, so, what's actually happening here is that. What we have, if we fill in the intermediate stages, is a surface mathematicians have a special name for. We call it a pair of pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Um, which topologically is just a hemisphere. And so we could have imagined that this movie had gone exactly the same way before time zero as well. And then what we would have is a sphere embedded in three dimensional space, in four dimensional space, in such a way that the central cross section was this knot. Well, okay, look, let me stop. Then I'm going to try and do it again, <laughs> but uh, let people go away who want to go away. <laughs> Thank you. 
watch out for this. I understand.